My name is Rick Mannon and I'm an inductee into the Brantford and Area Sports Hall of Recognition and today I'm thrilled to be interviewing Joe Pakula who was inducted into the Brantford and Area Sports Hall of Recognition in 1984 for the sport of football. Joe was a member of the St. John's College Green Eagles high school football team in 1960 when he accompanied his coach Reverend Harvey Roach to the Civic Stadium to see the Hamilton Tiger Cats practice. After the workout, the visitors sat down to eat with the players of the Thai Cats. Three years later, in 1963, a massive defensive tackle at six foot three and 235 pounds, Joe decided the previous spring that he was ready to try out for the berth on the Hamilton roster for the Thai Cats. So he showed up at the rookie camp. He wasn't invited, he just went. As a 19-year-old giant, Joe became the third player in Western Canada to jump directly from high school ranks to pro football. Although he was playing pro ball, Joe was going, still going to high school in grade 12 at St. John's College. The players used to kid Joe, claiming he was the highest paid high school kid in the country. Welcome, Joe. When we grew up, uh, that's all we did was play sports. We didn't have much money. Yeah, all the kids I grew up with. So every sport that came in season we played, be it baseball, uh, basketball, especially because you only needed a pair of uh, sh shoes and shorts. And football too, we played over by the Ross McDonald School on Brad Ann, where I grew up in that neighborhood. So it was a natural. And when I was in grade eight, I uh, was about five foot eight and about 175, 80 pounds. And I remember going to St. John's College and Father Roach was there and he says, you're going to play football next year, aren't you? And I said, well, I hope so, Father. I'll see how I do. Well, that summer I went to 6'1 and 219, so I definitely, <laughs> I had a growth spurt in there and I definitely uh, loved the game and played it. And uh, in those days there was only 90 boys at St. John's and we played both ways. You only had about 20 three, twenty-four guys on the team, so most, most of us played both ways, and it was a great way to, uh, to live a life in the high school, to be a football player and basketball player, whatever sport there was. The only thing we couldn't afford was hockey, so we didn't play much of that. So I was drawn to, uh, to uh, baseball, especially baseball and football and basketball. Joe, you were one of the youngest players to attend the CFL tryout. What was it like as a 19-year-old high school student to leave home, try out, and make the Hamilton Tiger Cats in 1963? Well, it was really unbelievable. The story about it, I uh, was living on my own. My parents were out of town, and I met Lonnie May. She was on a scholarship to uh, Kent State, and he said, Joe, why don't you come to the rookie camp in Hamilton? I says, well, what do you mean? He said, just come with me. I'm going. So I was working on construction at that time, and I says, oh, okay, I'll go. So I went to the rookie camp, and I walked in, and Vince Mazza, who was a big star in those days, and Hamilton was sitting there with a cigar in his mouth, and he went through these sheets looking for my invite, and he said, uh, I don't see your name. I says, well, what for? And he says, were you invited? I said, no. So he, said, he looked at me and said, well, take a chance, and I was number 124 in the rookie camp to... And I remember what it was like. It was scary because we went out and started doing cows and uh, jumping jacks and all that, and they started cutting right there. Right there in the first 10 minutes, they're cutting people. So being competitive, it meant uh, you, you, you jacked it up a little bit. You got ready. So uh, the big thing that made the impression in rookie camp, I was very fast. I ran the 100-yard dash once at 230 pounds at 11.1 .1 seconds. So... I was usually on the wind sprints, so I was the first down. I started noticing that they were writing my name down a little bit. So uh, we did go through the camp, and out of the 124, they kept four of us to go to pro camp. And what a thrill that was. It was really, really special. And just to get there and, and to make it was really, uh, it's hard to explain. It's like a story, fantasy story to believe even in this day now. Well, you must have some interesting experiences to us from that training camp. Can you share any with us? Oh, yeah, I can sh share a few while well, even going to pro camp. Uh, getting through the rookie camp was uh, 
very intense because everybody was trying to make an impression. People were going for scholarships and other things and uh, a lot of guys were there that were, they call it rookie camp, but there was older guys too in their 20s that were Canadians and trying to uh, get to the pro camp. So it was very intense and uh, hard hitting and uh, it, it took it took a lot out of everybody, but it was very enjoyable, uh, especially when you make it. That's what it made it enjoyable. And to get invited to pro camp was unbelievable to be sitting there the next week with people you only fantasize. Like the year before in 62 was the Fog Bowl and I was there sitting in the 53rd row and here I am next year at pro camp was Bernie Filoni, Hal Patterson, one of the greatest players ever. Garney Henley, of course, uh, so many of them. John Barrow, Angelo Mosca. We had so many superstars on that team and as a young kid who just turned 19 by a few weeks, it was, it was very, it was an education, and it's scary. <laughs> well, that year, you helped the Ticats win the Grey Cup. Uh, must have been an amazing experience for a young athlete. Can you talk about that? Oh, God, the, that day is etched in my brain like I could relive it even the, on the bus ride to the stadium. But another, uh, before I get into the game in that a little bit, there was a very significant event it's 50 years this year, that was since we played in the Great Cup, but it's also the 50th year that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, it was quite traumatizing to all of us at that time, but when we went to the Great Cup, uh, we were playing in Empire Stadium where the first sub four minute mile was ever writ or run by Bannister in the world. It was a beautiful old stadium and there was 40,000 people and there was a home town for Vancouver, the BC Lions, who we were playing, and I'll uh, never forget, before we went out to the, uh, the game to start, we kicked off, but they had a minute silence for John F. Kennedy, and I remember standing there as a 19-year-old kid playing in the Great Cup and looking at the outside the stadium, the whole crowd went dead silent. I could actually hear the seagulls, I could hear them now, you could hear them, and I was looking out the end of the stadium and the Rocky Mountains was there. We had a minute of silence and then they asked everyone to sing Old Canada. That started reverberating around the stadium and it just kept echoing. And I think my legs were shaking a little bit. But that, that was the start of it. It was such a memorable thing. And the game was unbelievable. I, I had an exceptional game. I, uh, I, I think I was on nine, nine uh, tackles, unassisted tackles, and Anna Stukas, who was the big TV man at that time, they actually interviewed me after the game, which was pretty unusual uh, on national TV. My, I know my parents were very proud, but it, it was a tough game. That's the year also that uh, Angelo Mosca and the Willie Fleming incident when uh, Angelo hit Willie, and he actually did hit him when he was off the ground. He wasn't down because I was about 20 feet away from it, and we seen that incident on uh, TV with uh, Joe Cap and Angelo uh, getting into the fight at the <laughs> few a few years ago. So I think Angelo actually beat him up. Uh, not in the game, we beat him up, and then in uh, 50 years later, it's still existing the feud between the two teams, and it really does. There's quite a bit of animosity there still to this day. But it was a beautiful day. It was a memorable day. Like I say, I can remember the bus ride down the stadium coming out of the walkway to the field, the fans were so rabid because it was the first time BC was playing in the Grey Cup, I believe, but it was the first time at home and, and uh, it was a tough game and, and we did win. And Hal Patterson, one of the greatest players ever to come out of uh, Kansas State, he actually was an All-American basketball player. Hal, uh, remember at halftime uh, saying that he could beat a guy and he actually drew up a play and we just sat there and waited for it and waited for it. and. Uh, he caught it and made a TD and I remember turning around to Bob Cross and I said, I think we just won the Great Cup. It was such an unbelievable feeling and the celebration is hard to explain. It, it's very, very hard. And I really at 19, when I look back, I don't realize, I didn't realize how great it was. It's even more memorable to me now. Yeah. It's a career ending injury in your third year halted a promising future in the CFL. 
How did that affect you? Oh, tremendously. Uh, the thing about it, it affected me tremendously, but actually might have been one of my best breaks at later on when you look in life because you're, you're part of a family. When I'm saying there's 30 of 30 guys and the hardest part is leaving that family because once that door closes behind you, you're not part of it. And it's funny in pro sports or any sports, once you're not there, you're not part of it. You're, you're divorced from it. And it's very, very difficult. I know when I seen the doctor in, in Hamilton General Hospital and he advised me not to play because he was uh, afraid that I, I could end up being paralyzed for life. And he just said to me, I'll never forget, I'm gonna just tell you like you're my son. You gotta give it up or you could end up a cripple. I did give it up and uh, you go on with life, different aspects of life and you learn from all these hardships. You learn from the glories and the hardships and it makes you a better person in the long run. But sports does make you a, a better person, be a woman, man. It really is great. So it was very, very difficult, but I did end up working for a beautiful organization. The LCBO provided me a good living for my life and for my wife and family and thankful for that. And so the good Lord always has something ahead of you and there's a reason for it. Do you think there's any equipment used different today that maybe not was available at that time that might have protected you from the injury? I don't know the type of injury I had. I actually, uh, I had a series of injuries that year. I just ran into a lot of bad luck. I, uh, uh, I remember September night, it was very, very cold. It warmed up well and everything. And the first injury happened, uh, not with equipment, with me. It ended up, I tore my hamstring muscle very bad. It was a cold night and uh, I was fast and I just tried to put a little extra push on my left leg and I felt the tear completely out. Then I had a torn rib cartilage. I had a high ankle sprain. And in those days, uh, you played uh, with injuries. Uh, that's the biggest thing. No, I, I, I say when I see these guys are hurt, that they don't play them and immediately they're getting treatment. Well, I know I got hit once in, uh, in, uh, in the head on the kickoff and, and the only re way I could find my way back to the bench was I know we, there was gold pants and that's all I could see. And I walked to the, where the gold pants were walking and I remember sitting down and I got smelling salts. I know that because it really jolted me. I remember the reaction I had and they just asked me my name and how many fingers were there and they, I said three and told them my name and they said you're ready to go. I said now I think that's the equipment now is, is better but I think the treatment of players is far superior when I watch what happens with these guys when they come back to the bench when you're watching they're they're, they're right there right away and they're checking everything out and making sure everything's fine uh, I think that's the biggest change I know the equipment's better but sometimes too I wonder uh, with the hardness of the equipment if it does contribute to injury so mine was completely medical and it was just some bad accumulation of things and I actually had actually two, I didn't say a slip disc with sciatic problems too. I ended up in the hospital for seven weeks after the season. So it was mostly medical. Do you have any mentors who have had an impact on your life, your sport or your career? Oh God, yeah, the biggest person was Father Harvey Roach. He, uh, he nurtured us. Like I said, we went to St. John's College. We had 90, 100 boys. And all of us, uh, most of us in the school were uh, part of some athletics. And what a wonderful way for kids to grow up to have that there. Uh, athletics is great. It kept us out of trouble, kept us tired. <laughs> we were busy. And uh, Father Roach uh, had a system and a discipline. And you followed that. And what it taught you was the team aspect. You worked as a team. But that also went into life. You, you work together with people. You, uh, it helped us further on. You, you work together. You weren't an individual. 
We had many great players. God, Ronnie Dosto, he ran a, at that time they disputed it, he ran a 100 yard dash. That's 100 yards, not 100 meters, and 9.3 at the University of Guelph. That year he set the record. I set the record for the shot put for 56 feet, 9 inches. And uh, Harvey Roach was always there leading us, giving us an example. He was coached us in basketball, football. He uh, kept the team aspect. We won the All-Ontario Basketball Championship in the winter of 63, 64, that, those two years. He mentored many young men, uh, but not only in sports, I, I, I would say uh, in life, which was the most important part because we all become ex-athletes, Rick, <laughs> you know that. Uh, and I think my parents, you know, thank God I had good parents. Uh, they had to work hard. My dad and mother had never seen me play uh, football or basketball because my dad had to work two jobs. He seen me play a little bit of baseball in between jobs. But I know him, they, uh, I got free tickets for the games and I used to give it to him. My dad used to say, oh, boy, your mother really bugs me. She doesn't know a thing that's going on out there. But they were loving and caring and, and uh, gave us a good, good life and a good example. So I'd say my parents and my brothers and then Harvey Roach definitely was athletic mentor. And then there was also a lot of baseball coaches that were good. Mr. Baker and so many of them. I just don't want to uh, leave anybody out because it's going back many years since I played baseball too. But there was great, great athletes to participate in all sports. Do you have any comments on the CFL game of today? I really like it. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, they're pro NFL all the time. Uh, uh, NFL, don't get me wrong, it's a different game. It's a different, smaller field. You got mammoth of guys, the size of them, they're just mammoth, but it's also a slower game. Like Canadian game is the field's wider, uh, it's longer. You need different type of athletes to play it. It's more wide open. Uh, I have friends say, oh, how can you watch the CFL? And I said, well, you watch the NFL. Uh, one guy makes a catch. I said, they got 15 cameras on the one catch. You see the same catch 15 times from a different angle. I says, I get tired of watching the same catch. I'd rather watch a game that's a little more open. I, I, I think it's a wonderful game, the Canadian game. I think, uh, like, it's a different athlete. Guys uh, can't make it in the NFL. I shouldn't say that. But the guys in the NFL couldn't make it up here because of the different aspect, being a yard off the ball, that they don't have the speed to cover the uh, sidelines. Uh, your linebackers are completely different, and so are your halfbacks and the quarterbacks. Look how, how the quarterbacks we have. Now the NFL is going to more open quarterback running. Well, we've had that for years. They're actually copying us, uh, I believe, in that aspect. So I think the CFL game is wonderful. I, I really enjoy it. And uh, I'd rather watch the CFL than the NFL. I know people have raised their eyebrows, but uh, you know I think the NFL has done a wonderful job. When we, when I played, we actually played the Bills. I didn't play in it in '62, and beat them. They played the CFL rules in one half and the NFL rules in the other half. But uh, that's just when the when the American Football League at that time was starting up, and and there was guys going like Cookie Girl Crest ended up being a big star in Buffalo and he ended up from uh, Tiger Cats down there. But I think it's a great game. What advice would you share with a young aspiring athlete, Joe? Oh, go for your dreams. Go for it. You, you don't have to be pro. You, you know, to make it, you don't have to be a pro athlete. You have to be an athlete that enjoyed what you did. That's the main thing. There's very few that get to the upper level, but that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy it. My daughter, I'm a little bit competitive, my daughter taught me a lesson. She was a very good athlete and she played basketball. She was MVP at St. John's in her midget or junior year, whatever, and she was a very good volleyball player. And I went to a volleyball game. She was playing against PJ. And I was sitting in the stands, and here's my daughter. She's smiling and laughing and to, with the opposition. To me, I said, oh, my God, how can you do that with the people you're playing against? You know, me, I was, <laughs> And I, I went 
I went to her after the game. I said, Naughty, I says, uh, uh, you know, I thought maybe you could have been a little more competitive. Uh, you were, you know, laughing with the girls and they're all laughing with you from PJ and all your teammates. And, and uh, she said, yeah, Dad, but I had a good time. And all of a sudden it hit me, you know. She, she's enjoying it. So that's the main thing, enjoy it. Treasure the moments, treasure your teammates. En enjoy your own memories, you'll have them. Nobody can take them away from you, can they, Rick? You can remember things like I can remember that Grey Cup day, nobody will ever know. I've always got it in my heart and my mind, so enjoy it. That's what I would tell you. And play it for the joy. You, everybody can't win, but everybody can participate and everybody can love it and everybody can have fun. So that's what I would say to a young athlete. Uh, what does it mean to you to be an inductee into the Bradford and Area Sports Hall of Recognition? Well, it's a privilege. It's an honor. We have so many great athletes in Brantford that have gone through uh, in their sports and not only athletes, you have Ted Bear and Arnold Anderson, what great ambassadors of sports they were. I believe Ted Bear could have been the top writer anywhere in Canada, United States, if he had pursued it. But his love was in Brantford, and I honor, I understand that. Same with Arnold. But to be in there, I sit down and think sometimes, in that hall, we have three athletes who were recognized as not only the best in their field, but the best in the world. You've got Wayne Gretzky. I don't have to go and tell a great story about Wayne. He's done that by himself. But also from Oshwegan, uh, you have the policies uh, that were voted the outstanding uh, lacrosse players in Canada in the world, Gaylord and, oh my God, I'm getting, you know, Ross. So there's Gaylord and Ross, and what a privilege just to be included with those guys. Uh, all the athletes, like, I'm not, there's so many wonderful people, and thank God, and I'm privileged and happy to be there. Thank you for having me there. Thank you.